Hi, I'm Darren and welcome to Level Up Double E Lab. I've finished all the work on my Drake TR3 and the matching RV3 and they're both working again. Let's have a look at how the process turned out. All right, my custom designed relay board has arrived. As I showed in the prior episode, I whipped up a two-sided layout with duplicated traces on the top and bottom copper layers. And of course, plated through holes for all the solder connections. Looks like I did a good job with the physical layout because the relay socket popped right in. As for soldering it, the spec sheet recommends doing it with the relay inserted. Apparently that way the individual terminals get aligned to the relay pins and you'll reduce the risk of a solder joint cracking later in use. Next up is to solder the board to the feed-through capacitor assembly. Yep, these look pretty ugly, but they do still measure correctly at 1 nanofarad. So fingers crossed that they'll continue to hold up. Soldering to the caps was a piece of cake. I sized the board holes at 2.5 millimeters, which is the same size as the eyelets on the former board. That size seems to give a pretty decent solder joint and still has enough clearance to absorb the positional tolerance during assembly to all six of the caps. I'll skip showing the installation and soldering of this assembly into the rig. <laughs> Let's just say getting all those wires soldered to the other side did not make for entertaining video and I'll just cut to the relay installation. Now that part goes real smooth, just plug it in. That and plugging in this cute little light bulb protector for the receive circuit. The final bit of cosmetic work on the TR3 is fixing the faded red nubbin on the dial calibration plate. The top secret method? Just use a red sharpie. The plastic that the nubbin is made from is absorbent, so sharpie ink soaks right in and problem solved. Now to spend a few minutes with the RV3. It's in very good cosmetic condition. The front panel and controls don't have appreciable wear and tear on them, so clearly this RV3 does not have much mileage on it. The biggest cosmetic item is this tape residue. I'll carefully try to remove it, but even so, there's likely permanent paint damage underneath it. Inside, all three tubes are present, along with a thick coating of dust. I'll need to pull the chassis out of the case to clean it and inspect it. Okay, wow, this guy really wants to put up a fight. Ah, there we go. Got it out without breaking a tube. The PTO rotates smoothly, so there's nothing I need to address on it. There's really not that much to it topside, and underneath, there's not much more. It's just an oscillator circuit, after all. I checked all the resistors and they measured just fine. That and no film or electrolytic caps means there's nothing to replace here. So all it needed was just a few minutes of cleaning. Now that's what the Drake copper chassis is supposed to look like. Just look at that shine. Time to power them up. Okay, I've completed all the repairs and cleaning in the TR3 and I have it mostly put back together. I've got the top and bottom covers just setting on here right now, mostly because there's hazardous voltages on top of the chassis and I just want to make sure that they're covered for this initial tryout. Um, as far as my setup here, of course, the usual Zen bulb tester is present, but I don't have the bulb installed because I know I'd really just want to use the isolation transformer portion of it and the variac so I can bring the voltage up slowly. Um, I don't really need to have the bulb in there for this test. I've already tested out the power supply and if there is a problem with the rig, there's a fuse um, there's a fuse in the power supply, there's a fuse in the dim bulb tester, so hopefully those will be adequate. I've also got the RV3 over here. I don't have it inside the case yet because I'm going to have to do alignment on it and the TR3, so I figured uh, I might as well just leave it out. Oh, and of course the power supply. Now I don't have it back in the housing with the RV3. It's back there in the back of the bench. Now there's definitely hazardous voltages on the top of that PC board, so I'm staying away from it while I do this checkout here. And then lastly, I've got the TR3 connected to my outdoor antenna just to be able to try and pick up some signals. So what I'm going to do, I've got the power switch on. Of course, the transmitter gain turned way down. That's on sideband, 40 meters. And I'm going to turn on the dim bulb tester and start bringing up the voltage slowly. And I should see the bulb start to glow here and hear something. So here we go. This item contains hazardous voltage and safety precautions must be followed. If you're following along and working on your own version, 
you're doing so at your own risk. I know you guys can't see the voltage on the dim bulb tester, but right now it's about 30 volts AC, and I keep bringing it up. About 70 volts AC. Ninety volts, and I see the lower side band indicator starting to glow. So I've got some voltage there, and I'm about 110. So I'm going to leave it right about there, 110, 115, and just wait for things to warm up. And of course, I'm going to turn up the audio gain. And hey, that's encouraging. There's sound coming out of it. Let's see if it's actually tuning. How about that? Right. Uh, Got to peak the uh, RF tune to be able to hear it. Try to find a stronger signal. Excellent. All right. Let me try. That's forty meters. Let me try twenty meters. Now it is about mm, 8 p.m. my time here, so 20 might be starting to fade out, but let's see. Oh, maybe not. All right. Hey, I'm gonna go for broke here. I'm gonna switch it. I'm gonna switch it over to the RV3. So to do that, control panel switch. I turn this to receive. And let's see what I get. At the low end of the band here, I gotta come up. So. There we go. 14.02. How about that? Let's see if I can find the uh, FT8 crowd. There they are. Pretty cool. <laughs> Don't think I could copy it off the RV3 though. So this is really encouraging. This is about the best result I could hope for turn this down but the best result I could hope for for just initially powering this up it seems to be working fine on receive uh, what I need to do next here I've got to set or check the bias for the uh, transmit stage and for those um, adjustments and the rest of the alignment I'm going to disconnect it from the antenna and hook it up to a dummy load and go from there well I found my first issue here that I've got to deal with <laughs> and it goes back to something that I was talking about earlier in the series when I had to reassemble the PTO and I wasn't quite sure if I got the gear train set right uh, to have the hard stops take place when the slug gets inside that um, coil moves in and out and I use my other uh, TR3 as kind of the referee to set it. Well I'm way off. Um, if you look on the dial right now um, I'm just below 7 megahertz, so I've tuned down the dial, and that's right where the FT8 crowd is at 7.074 megahertz. So that should be like way off over here on that side of, of the dial. Now, you think, well, on these drakes, you, you can spin the acrylic disc that's in there and you know adjust it, but that's not the problem. The real problem is this. That's the hard stop. It cannot go any lower. 
So I definitely put that PTO together incorrectly. So I'm going to have to fix that. I don't think it's going to be that hard of a fix. I think it's going to be a situation where I might have to take the PTO back out of the rig and work on it. I'm hoping not, but definitely going to have to dig into that. And I got to do that first before I do any of the alignment. I decided to be a little scientific and try to quantify just how far off this PTO is and how much I'd have to adjust it. So what I decided to do is look at the frequency it's operating at. And I've got that shown kind of in the background. You can't see it very well, but uh, let's see. Get my finger in this frame right there. My siglent is picking up the VFO signal and displaying the frequency. Now the frequency calculation of the siglent isn't as accurate as say a standalone frequency counter, but it's too within I mean, it reports down to 10 hertz, which is plenty accurate enough for what I need to, to do here. So I got the VFO up against the hard stop, and it's telling me that the VFO frequency that it's picking up is 5.42840 megahertz, okay? Um, question might be, well, how am I measuring that and not loading the circuit? Well, there's a clever little way that you can at least get a usable frequency signal on a vacuum tube circuit and I'll move the camera so we can see it a little better. You just take a piece of wire and make a coil around the oscillator tube like I've done there and one end of it connects to the 10 times probe. Of course the ground clip on the uh, 10 times probe goes to the chassis. Now those are at the same ground potential, the chassis of this rig and the scope, so no problem there. And it's just loosely coupled, it's just whatever energy that that coil happens to pick up on that tube and as you can see on the scope it's plenty I mean I got that scope uh, vertical axis sent to 20 millivolts per division so that's plenty of signal for the siglent to figure out what that, uh, that frequency is so what I've done is look at what the frequency is on the on the uh, TR3 and then of course look at the same thing the same circuit is on the RV3 and so I put its PTO up against the hard stop and looked at what its uh, setting is, just assuming of course the RV3 is correct, which is a safe enough assumption. So it was at 5.50827 megahertz. So I just subtract those two values and I get 0 0.07987 megahertz, which is almost 80 kilohertz that the uh, TR3 is off. And then the last thing I did, there's a pointer here on the tuning dial. So I just turned it to the pointers at 12 o'clock, looked at the frequency, and then spun it a full turn, and then looked at the frequency again, and then calculated what is the, the change in frequency per revolution. And that's just under 25 kilohertz, about 24.9 kilohertz per rotation. So I can compare that 79.8, 79.9 kilohertz, I'm off, compared to 24.9 per turn, I'm off just over 3.2 turns. So I think if I just take the gear train apart slightly and rotate the dial gear set uh, three turns, I think I'll be close enough to get that TR3 where it needs to be. Well, as it turns out, that's all I had to do to fix the PTO offset problem. I did remove the backlight shield behind it so I could better access the gear train, and I just temporarily swung the gear set far enough away to disengage it, just used a, a small screwdriver to do that, then rotated the slug out three more turns, took the screwdriver back out, re-engaged the gear train, and all is well now. So I proceeded to do the alignment on the TR3, but I did not record it, which is just as well. I had no intentions going into the series of making a documentary on the TR3 alignment. Now there's 14 steps, and I might have shown, uh, I think earlier in the series, I've got my own uh, cheat sheet that I made so I can keep notes as I go through, just copied elements out of the, uh, the manual for that. Um, of those 14 steps, some of them are a little lengthy. Um, I estimate it took me about four to six hours to complete the alignment, and I even have to fabricate this guy right here. It's an alignment load per the instructions that are in the manual. It's a 1K resistor in series with a five nanofarad cap, and you use that at certain points, I think, to detune the circuitry so that you can peak it properly. Um, I did get stuck at one point. I could not remember how I did that particular step on my other TR3 a few years ago, but I got lucky. I ran across K8BYP's channel on YouTube, and I want to thank him for some really good instruction on several portions of the TR3 alignment, one of which 
I'm going to demonstrate here in a little bit on the RV3 because there's one alignment step to do on it, and I'll show you how I do that. Well, I'll cut to the chase. I finished the alignment with no issues, so that was a big relief. Uh, none of the adjustments were way out of whack during the alignment, including the neutralization. And that sometimes can be a real frustrating thing in these rigs is to get them neutralized, but I think I got it, so we're all good there. And since I finished the alignment, that means that the rig now transmits, and it puts out decent power, around 150 watts on CW mode on most of the bands, except 10 meters. It's a little less there, one. 20-ish, but that's perfectly fine because that's also with me running the plate current at about 350 to 400 milliamps, and that's less than the 450 max that's in the manual, and I'm doing that deliberately. I don't want to push those 12 JB6s, the three final amplifier tubes in this rig that hard because they're not made new as far as I can tell, and trying to get a set of three of them that are close enough in performance, I hesitate to even call them matched in this day and age, it's going to set you back at least 100 bucks, so it's really not worth it to try to squeeze every last watt out of this rig when you know you can get at least 100, and that's plenty. So I can only guess at this point it was the broken resistor R40 that was preventing it from transmitting. And here's a quick demo of aligning the RV3. Like I said, the manual indicated that there's only one adjustment. It's just peaking transformer T1, and it's right here on the chassis, and it's got an adjustment on the bottom and an adjustment uh, on the top. Now the manual says to set this up by putting the TR3 on 80 meters and then dial in the crystal calibrator signal at 3.8 megahertz and turn it on and adjust T1 to peak the reading on the S meter. And that, I guess, will work just fine, but K8BYP's advice is use your digital multimeter and connect it to the AGC circuit on the TR3, which is exactly what I'm doing right here. So I get a much more um, I guess quantitative value, I guess you could say, instead of the qualitative reading on the S meter, and then just peak that. And because it's AGC voltage, it's negative, so you're looking for the most negative peak that you can find there. So I've already done the first step of this. Uh, here's the alignment load I mentioned earlier. I had it attached to the input of T1 and then adjusted the bottom slug for the instructions. And I have now moved the uh, alignment load to the output and I'll peak the, the top adjustment here, and here's what that looks like. So let me turn on the calibrator, turn the volume down just a little bit, and then proceed to adjust the top slug, and hopefully it's not too far off. Uh, come on, gotta find the slot in it. That's always a challenge with these tiny things. Here we go. It's coming more negative. And that looks to be about the peak. I crossed it, so let me go back. Try to hit it again. Okay, that seems to be it. So what I will do, I'll recheck it moving the load back to the other side of the circuit and just go back and forth one more time and make sure I got it. But at this point I am done with the alignment. I'm going to put the bottom cover back on the TR3. I'm going to put the RV3 and the AC3 power supply back into their case and wrap this project up. All right, let's see if I can make some QSOs with this rig. So what I've got here, I've got the Model 727 Drake microphone plugged in. And my MN4 tuner, um, I don't really need the tuner function, but I like having the watt meter um, when I'm doing tune-up, and of course the dummy load right on top. So let's give this a spin. November. Thank you. Kilo Alpha 9, November November radio. Kilo Alpha 9, November November radio, thank you. You're 5 and uh, 8. My name is Mike. We're running remote from Western Massachusetts. Give us up. Roger, roger. Thank you very much, Mike. Name here is Darren, Delta Alpha Romeo Yankee November, and you're my first contact in my recently refurbished Drake TR3. How's my audio? Go ahead. Oh, the audio is good. The modulation is good. Uh, pretty good overall. Over. Thanks very much, and 73s. Thank you very much, 73 November. I'm really happy to have successfully completed the repairs on this classic rig and get it back on the air again. Now, I will continue to troubleshoot what's ailing it on 80 meters and hopefully figure out why I can't get a good plate dip. 
Plus, there's a few simple modifications I want to make, starting with adding a cooling fan for the finals. Now, this is a very commonly done mod to these rigs to help extend the life of the final tubes. And I put one on my Drake T4X a few years ago, so I have a general idea of what I want to accomplish here. I don't want to add a ton of airflow, just enough to kind of boost that natural convection a bit. And in this case, I want to design um, a th and 3D print a little bracket to set it on right here and not have to drill or modify the cover in any way. And it goes without saying these old tube rigs do dissipate a lot of heat. There's somewhere on the order of about 50 watts just to drive the heater filaments in these 20 tubes. That's all going to get dissipated as heat. And plus the transformer in the AC3 gets a little warm too. So it's definitely more comfortable to run this setup in the wintertime than the summertime. Another project that I want to do is fabricate a cover for the back of the housing that holds the AC3. It's wide open and I do have that circuit board on top of it now so it's a bit hazardous to have that voltage exposed now on the ac4 the later model power supply the whole thing is enclosed so it's a little easier to protect it but i think i can come up with just a simple cover that'll help make that safer cosmetically there's nothing pressing i was able to remove the tape residue from the top of both of them but as i feared the paint ended up slightly etched from the glue I applied a coat of automotive wax and that helped a bit, but it probably needs a touch of rubbing compound and that's beyond my skill. So I do hope you enjoyed this short series on the Drake TR3 and its accessories. And as always, I thank you for watching my channel. So until next time, bye for now.